Welcome to the Ask Me How I Know podcast, the only podcast in the multifamily niche replicating what takes place outside the walls of a seminar. This is like the lobby where honest, unscripted conversations take place and transformation happens. We'll talk about practical problem solving in the multifamily niche, as well as overcoming limiting beliefs. Thank you for joining us today and now for our featured guest. Welcome back to Ask Me How I Know. We have um, Emma Powell with us today, and she and I have been doing our pre-show. And sometimes, actually, usually I wish I would record the pre-show, but that's like, that's, those are the special moments right there. <laughs> so anyhow, Emma has a lot to share that's going to help um, build your playbook and your mindset. And I love that. I love that, Emma, I love that you see the balance between like, hey, I need to perform and do X, Y, Z, but in order to do that, I have to have my mind in check as well. So we're going to just jump right on in. Emma, you have been a passive investor. Is that right? Or um, Yeah, you, I you started out. on so many different levels, so maybe I should back that up. You, you've invested <laughs> on lots of levels, but I'm specifically thinking of a situation where it sounds like you were acting as a passive investor and maybe turned a little bit, had its, had its little obstacles. Little, yeah, well, I, I started out um, as a passive investor by loaning um, the equity that we had on the house that we remodeled and sold when, when we moved from Texas to Utah and met the guy at Aria. He was um, well-respected, well-established in the space. And so we basically put that home equity with him for about 10 months or so. And that ended up going great. He became a great mentor for me. And I learned that if you have some money to place, place it with somebody who's willing to spend the time mentoring you. Because I got a mentor from that situation where I didn't pay him, he paid me. And so that was the first lesson. Nice. Learned about being a passive investor is that don't go so big that they don't have the time of day for you or so small they don't know what they're doing. But somebody accessible who's going to take your phone call and answer your questions. Um, and I felt like that was really valuable. Even though I ended up not flipping houses, that was what he did. Um, I learned that that wasn't really something that I wanted to be doing. Um, and then while that money was out with him, um, we we hooked up with a financial advisor who ended up being um, not a good source of advice. And so he set up my retirement account to be self-directed, which the self-directed setup is fine. Um, and that's something that I advocate people who are wanting to passively invest should do with things like home equity lines of credit and, and self-directed IRAs and be able to get out your money and have more control about where you invest it. Um, but the deal that he in, in encouraged us to invest in uh, the way that he set that up uh, has some major tax implications and basically negates um, the fact that it's a self-directed IRA. So we're going to have to take it as a distribution on our taxes and that tax hit. Um, and then plus what he had us invest in, which was a business loan, um, which we've now been dealing with almost two years. Um, and they just offered us a settlement, but I think it's just more shenanigans about how he's going to get out of paying this um, basically wiped out the entire account between the tax hit and then not having the original investment in returned, much less the interest that we were promised on that loan. So um, on the one hand, I had somebody who ended up being very trustworthy that we gave a lot more money to who was very responsible with it and returned it. Um, and I was a difficult investor. <laughs> I um, love that you're I like, no, I was pull out little like, why would you say pieces, that? Because this deal that he had, you know, was six months. Yeah. yeah. It ended up being the longest flip that he ever did. Like it took the record. I think it was 14 or 15 months before he finally closed that thing. And so about nine months, I was getting antsy and asking for my money back. He had recommended that we purchase a home instead of renting. So we needed down payment for that. So he, he refinanced out the down payment for our home. And then I wanted to buy an investment home. So he refinanced out the down payment I needed for that. And like the third time I came to him and said, you know, this is taking a really long time and I have another investment home that I'd like to buy. Um, he just, he just ended up replacing my money, returning all of it, even though he hadn't sold the house yet. Um, and he, just, you know, he has actually spoken at my local meetup that we have here in Salt Lake about educating passive investors. 
And, um, you know, he just, he likes to tease me about how, how you can get difficult passive investors and then he'll look right at me. And, and, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, those are some important questions that you need to ask. I asked him at the beginning, how do I get my money back? If I need my money back, how do I do it? And he walked me through the process of what that would look like. And so I took him up on it. Um, how long is this going to take? And he told me it typically takes this long. The longest flip he's ever done is 12 months. This one ended up being 14. So you have to go into it knowing that your money's tied up and what you're going to do in an emergency. Um, and so he helped walk me through that process and teach me those things. So if I was you know, asking for my money back or being difficult, you know, he was, he was really patient and he worked with me and I learned a lot. So you're going to have some passive investors who need a little babysitting because they're either skittish and they've never done it before, like I was, or they might want to be active investors and be moving their money around a little faster, which is again, what I was. And so how long that money is going to be out is a big consideration. And then if you change your mind and you want it back, can you, you know, what is, what would that look like? you know, what time period and, and what's the structure of, of replacing your cash in a deal. So those, those were some important lessons that I learned also um, to do a better job of vetting out the people that, that you work with. I mean, uh, hiring a private investigator and running a background check is like, what, 150 bucks. It's when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars and you're not doing those basic things to vet out the people that you're taking advice from and the people that you're investing with, um, right. that was just stupid on my part. What are, what are some of the things that you would, that you recommend people do to vet, especially, I mean, again, I always say like, we've been, people been calling, you know, a shift in the economy for a long time and that, you know, some of the players in the syndication world are going to get called to the carpet because of their, you know, mismanagement and poor practices. And so there have been so many people discussing, you know, hey, how should a uh, passive investor look at and assess you know, someone that, you know, a sponsor or an operator, you know, how are they going to assess the GP really? Like, what would you recommend? Yeah. Um, you need to get the information from them to run a background check on them. Like I said, it could be, it could be surface level. Just, just the same way that I do when I'm vetting out my tenants, you just pay like a $35 fee and they check their credit and their criminal history and, um, the, and they get that report back. You can hire a private investigator um, usually through your attorney's office um, or your attorney can do some discovery, um, and which is how I found out about what was going on with the guy that I invested with that ended up not being uh, trustworthy. He had an, um, at the time I invested with him, he had an old judgment against him that he had, was not paying that I didn't know about. And then I found out about that just by searching his name on the internet and putting, you know, such and such name and then following it up with either scam um, criticism. You want to you want to choose words that are negative because when I looked him up the first time, I just put his name in there and maybe his company name, and I was finding pretty good stuff. He'd been in business for a while, and he had professional. He had an SEC form D filed uh, that I found, and so uh, it wasn't until I started typing in scam, con, criticism, um, judgments, things like that, lawsuits that I started finding some stuff. And so that's when I contacted my attorney and they did some more discovery and, and found some things that um, now his attorney tells me are settled. Um, but is he paying on the settlement? Is he paying on the judgments? That's what we're still trying to figure out. So those basic types of, of searches, working with your attorney, working with your private investigator and working with the background check service, it's, it's a couple of hundred bucks. I think my attorney charged me like 300 bucks to do this, the background check, like I said, $35, $50. If you're going to get a PI, another $150 to $300. It's not that much money when you're considering how many tens of thousands of dollars or maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars, like I invested in the first deal, right. um, to, to, to begrudge a hundred, couple hundred, even a couple thousand dollars to do your due diligence. Make sure they don't have SEC violations if they're a syndicator. Make sure that they don't have any open lawsuits or old judgments that have not been paid. Those, those types of things can be found out, pay a couple hundred bucks and do it right. Yeah. And I think that, so, you know, it's so easy to get wrapped up in this deal. It looks good. The numbers are right. You know, I mean, most investors are savvy enough to go keep the emotions out, look at the numbers, numbers look great. And then you fall in love with the numbers, <laughs> you know, and instead mm -hmm. of looking at, you know, the potential downside and, 
you know, PPM basically. Like what could really go wrong here and who are these people? Um, hey, just circling, oh, go ahead. Well, we had stayed out of a lot of bad deals by just not investing. Um, so I can tell you three or four or five stories of different investors when I was a kid um, who went to prison for bad accounting, who went to prison for running Ponzi schemes. Um, some of them were devastating to the people in my community when I was a kid with my parents, friends. And then again, when we were young adults uh, living in Texas, there was a, a massive um, Ponzi scandal in our circle of friends where a lot of people lost a lot of money, it cost a lot of pain. And, and this, this individual is in federal prison for you know, almost 20 years. Um, Ponzi, yeah. So, and I don't think any of those people intended to defraud people at the beginning, but they ended up doing a, a severe amount of damage. So watching people around us go through those things, um, we just hadn't invested with them. We just didn't trust them. And so then when we started getting where our lives were a little bit more comfortable, we had a little bit more money to invest, a little bit more ability to be risky with some of our, some of our money yeah. um, without just keeping it in the bank. Um, that was when we got taken advantage of. And so I feel like we watched all of that go down and didn't, <laughs> you know, we watched them practice forgiveness and recovery and being able to get straight with feeling safe with their money again, but we never really even asked them like, well, what would you have done differently to vet this guy out? One of them didn't have any record. There wouldn't have been anything to discover. Wow. So it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to say, but um, just make sure the old advice, don't invest what you can't afford to lose. Sound and, advice and we went into there. the field. yeah we knew we knew that we could afford to lose what we lost and it still hurts it's still embarrassing um but at the end of the day we didn't need it right we're still fine without it and so that i think is the key to not letting your attitude your trust and being able to invest um not eat you alive at the end of the day is because we only placed money that we didn't need to have back yeah yeah hey sleeping at night is not overrated because if you're not sleeping at night your health deteriorates everything goes south so i'm a big proponent of hey make sure that whatever you're doing you can sleep like a baby at night absolutely yeah well so yeah just just a flip side to this um so what would you say because one of my concerns and i think it's legit you know is you know, as the tides shift in the economy, I'd love to just get your, your two cents on this, um, you know, and some of the people who've been syndicating during this, you know, during the bull, mar bull market, you know, and now they're going to be called out and we're going to see, you know, we, we've both heard it. It's like, oh, we're going to see who is swimming naked in the ocean. And, you know, like, so then to recover as investors, you know, syndicators and to show potential investors, hey, this really is a good investment and this really is safe. Like there's going to be a heightened level of skepticism is what I'm, what I'm anticipating mm -hmm. down the road. So, and you've experienced this. So what made you more comfortable or what's made you comfortable continuing to invest um, now besides running the show yourself like a rock star? <laughs> um. I think what from what I've seen and what I mentioned briefly before is that people who get themselves into situations where they're running Ponzi schemes, embezzling, losing money, um, most of the time do not set out to defraud people. They end up defrauding people because they're trying to save the sinking ship, end up making little compromises until they justify what they're doing as as trying to protect their investors and all of these, all of these things, the stories that they tell themselves in their mind that are that are false and they're doing illegal things. And when they get caught, there are massive consequences. To this day, um, these particular people that I'm thinking of um, still don't believe that they did anything wrong. Oh. And, and they need to believe that in their own head in order to sleep with themselves at night. And so right. watching the ship sink is when people really start doing risky behaviors and justifying things. So if you're in an investment as a passive investor, um, I don't think you need to be as educated as the deal sponsor. One of the reasons I sponsor deals 
is because um, I want to be 100% passive investor and our nest egg wasn't big enough to do that. And so we needed to double the size of the money that we had so that we could place it and, um, and be able to basically just retire, you know, fire financial independent, retire early type of thing. And right. so we got into active investing to double that pile. So I'm learning a lot as we are active deal sponsors, it's going to serve me well when I, when we shift gears to becoming totally passive again. Right. Um, but there are certain minimums that you need to know as a passive investor. Again, vet your operator, run the appropriate background checks, be able to read the financial reports and statements that they send out and make sure that you understand them. You don't have to go through every nitty gritty line item, but you should be able to read the profit and loss statement um, and the investor summaries that they send you monthly or quarterly and feel comfortable with them. Take it to your CPA, ask the deal sponsor, ask a different deal sponsor so that if you see some things that are starting to be red flags, those are the things that cause those deal sponsors to start getting um, fast and loose with the way that they're running the business because they don't want things to go bad. And that's when they start doing things that are dishonest or, or illegal. Um, so keeping your eye on that, read the reports. A lot of people, they don't even read them. They show up monthly or quarterly and they just pop them in their binder and ignore it because they are still getting their checks. When the checks start getting smaller, when the reports start looking weird, just make sure you have a good, a good accountant um, that can keep you on top of that. These investments, it could be like the four hour work week, um, but passive investing is not a zero hour work week. You do need to be able to babysit your investments. Um, so that's, that in my opinion is the best thing you can do to protect yourself and just be aware that because this guy is a good guy and he's trustworthy and you like him, you've worked with him before and it went well, it's when the ship is sinking that they start doing things they shouldn't be doing. And that's, and, and they won't even admit to themselves that what they're doing is wrong. So just keep an eye on it, you know, make sure you're babysitting it, make sure you understand it. And again, make sure you know how to get your money back when you see things that are maybe concerning to you. Because everybody who has a background that something shows up on their background has a first time that they did that. So what <laughs> if you got them before he came? Yeah. You don't want to be the first one. No. You need to know how to protect yourself, how to get the money back, what's illegal, what's not illegal. Again, not as deeply as a deal sponsor would need to know, but at a basic level that your CPA and your attorney uh, educate you on. Yeah. Wow. That is, that's awesome. I, that's really helpful. I think for everybody just to be reminded, um, you know, passive investors, there are so many people I'm reaching out all the time, trying to <laughs> recruit people into passive investing, the typical, you know, Hey, get your money off of wall street. And I've been preaching this and I'm like, do you just see what happened the last two weeks, guys? <laughs> like, come on, okay. you know, but, but a lot of people need, they need some, them, uh, little bumper guards, if you will, you know, to make them more comfortable because it's a completely new arena. For, so like, just kind of like your little simple guideline is really helpful for a lot of people that want to get into passive investing, but they're not really like, I don't know, this is like a ton of money. Ah, I don't want to lose it. <laughs> but like you're saying, don't risk what you can't lose. As adage says, um, can I go... Well I, let me just add, a lot of people have their money in the bank and it's not making a very good return. And so if their major concern was, was not losing money, they would leave it in a bank. And so what happens is that they're like, I know I should be getting at least a better return than what I should be getting in a bank. And that's why they start thinking about investing in the first place. And so that underlying concern of, I don't want to lose money could very easily be taken care of by keeping it in a bank. They're looking for a better return. And so yeah. at the end of the day, they want their capital returned, but they are looking for a better return. And if they're looking for a better return than what's easy, leaving it in the bank or leaving it in one of those targeted date mutual funds, they're trying to do something that's a little bit more advanced than that to get a little bit better return, then a little bit of extra education needs to go along with that. As much as they claim, I just want to make sure my money's safe, that's not true. Or they would leave it in the bank or they'd leave it in a mutual, you know, a, a targeted date mutual fund. Those are easy. I don't think the mutual funds are particularly safe as we're seeing right now. Um, 2008, I, it was when my dad kind of had to retire on what his mutual fund was doing at the time. Um, oh, and then he passed, he passed away recently and we're just dispersing his IRA accounts right now, right now. So he, <laughs> he, 
he got hit doubly hard in the stock market when he retired and then again when he passed away in his inheritance. So I'm not thinking that the stock market is particularly safe, but it certainly is is easy to put in a targeted fund and just let it sit there. It's easy to leave it in a bank and get poor returns. Um, but if you're looking for a little bit more return, a little bit better return, you better be a little bit educated. Yeah. Again, not advocating to become an expert, but you should know the basics and be able to keep an eye on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you don't mind, I have this like burning question from like earlier in the conversation. Are you guys getting hit with UBIT taxes? Is that what happened with uh, with the the situation that you guys are in settlement over and everything? Was it UBIT taxes no. that came up or? No, I think we're going to have to take a disbursement on the retirement fund, basically a cash out. So we're going to have to take that tax hit on, and it's still ongoing. So, um, and I don't claim to understand exactly what's going on, and we're still trying to find some solutions. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, making sure that you understand how you can use the funds in your retirement account um, is important as well, because you're going to move it over into a qualified retirement fund, like a solo 401k or self-directed IRA. Um, and you just, you just need to work with a custodian who can, who can teach you what's, what's okay and what's not okay and stay away from things that are aggressive. Um, you'll have advisors tell you, you can do all sorts of things that are creative and aggressive. Um, make sure you just stay inside the lines because maybe you'll be okay doing something aggressive and maybe you won't, maybe you'll get burned. Yeah. So be conservative. Yeah. But there's a lot of people, um, you know, I, they don't know about UBIT taxes and they don't, you know, and it comes up to bite them when they go to, you know, leave the, you know, leave the investment and next thing you know, they're getting slapped mm -hmm. with this and they're like, what? <laughs> so I, that was yeah. what I was curious because I've seen a lot of, um, like one very prominent, you know, investor that everyone knows, you know, that was how I learned about UBIT taxes and, you know, went on his, he was talking on his podcast about, you know, I got slapped with this, like what? <laughs> so, yeah. And I think the solo on the solo 401k has a, has a better ability to weather that than the self-directed IRA. And again, that's just something, a conversation you have with your CPA yeah, uh, so that they can explain the differences to you. Cause I, 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 I can't, I don't know exactly what it is. I just know that depending on what you're investing in, I'm meeting with my attorney again next week, a new attorney um, to basically redo my estate plan and my asset protection plan. Because when I did it the first time, um, my business model is completely different. And so you need to keep those things updated with your attorney. Um, and I, I told my attorney, I said, this is really difficult for me to go in and spend this money on redoing all of this. Because one, I felt like the guy who did it originally um, ended up kind of doing me harm. Um, and I spent a lot of money on setting those things up. And now I've got to go back and redo it because the business model has changed. Um, and it's, it's hard. I said, but at the same time, I know it has to be done. And I was like, I see you as a cost, not a revenue producer. And he's just laughing. And he's like, I totally get it. I, I understand. It's like paying for insurance. Uh, you don't really get any revenue out of that, but it could really save your business when things, things go south. So just being able to pony up for the good legal, the right legal, the right tax advice, um, asset planning and, you know, um, or sorry, estate planning and asset protection. Um, again, like doing background checks, it's going to cost you some money up front and it's not exactly revenue generating activity, but just go get caught without an umbrella policy. Oh, man. Just go get caught without, you know, privacy and, and protections of your assets. Yeah, yeah exactly. You suddenly realize that was a small price to pay. I wish I would have paid that amount because that's nothing compared to what's happening now. <laughs> what's what And the opportunity to go do bigger deals, to go in with more knowledge, uh, having a better network and being able to go and do things with your money that is going to grow up beyond that. I, this sounds a little bit doom and gloom. I think the conversation is turning towards it. This is going to scare oh, no. passive investors. It's not. But at the same time, <laughs> yeah, the more you know, the less risk you take. People will look at something that somebody else is doing and say, oh, your risk tolerance must be so high. That seems so risky. But that person, because they know so much about it and they love it, are really um, 
are really learning and they're really uh, lowering their, their risk threshold by understanding what they're doing better. And, and I would say, if you think you should invest in real estate because somebody told you you should, but you hate real estate, <laughs> every time you try and learn about it, you, you don't want, you, you don't understand what's going on. You get frustrated. You want to throw the book in. Um, maybe that's not the best place for you to invest in. There are other places to invest besides real estate and the stock market. There are other asset classes you might understand better. I mean, I know people who do oil and gas futures. That I, I don't have any interest in that. And if I try, just because somebody told me it was a good deal, I probably wouldn't even understand the information that I was looking at. And so I don't invest in those things because it's too risky for me. Yeah. It might not be too risky for them. So yeah. make sure that you're investing in something that you like and that you that you can understand at least on the fundamental level that you need to, to be as a passive investor. I don't invest in the stock market. I've tried and tried and tried. I know a lot of people have been very successful in the stock market. We've sat down, we've had lunches, they've explained, I've looked at, I don't get it. I don't like it. I'm not interested. Right. Real estate is my baby. I love it. I, I eat, breathe, drink. So you know, I'm not saying I'll never invest anything in the stock market, but I'm certainly not going to go into risky stock market types of scenarios because I don't get it and I don't ever want to. <laughs> I, I will say, I told my husband on the way to the gym yesterday, I'm like, gosh, I, I'm not, we're not into the stock. We pulled out completely last fall. And I just told him like, I wish I understood it because I feel like now's the time to short something. I'm like, I don't, I don't even really understand that, but Man, if we understood it, if we had that, it's, it's what you're saying. It's like, it's not, you know, there's a huge risk, but if you know what you're doing, you're probably going to play the hand the right way. So, yeah. If you like it, you're going to look at it. If you don't like it, you're going to procrastinate it. And that's, <laughs> that's the, that's the litmus test right there. If you like something, you'll do it willingly. And if you don't like it, you'll put it off and put it off and put it off. And that's where you start getting into dangerous territory. Like I understand how to short the dollar with a mortgage. It totally makes sense to me. I didn't even really have to have anybody explain it to me, but shorting the stock market, I, I would have to go look that up. I just, it's the same type of concept and I just don't get it at all. So I, that's, that's, that's a good indicator right there on what you should be investing in and how to control your risk by what you're willing to educate yourself in. You know, the, your brain actually also is going to respond to that. It's interesting when you look at it and on cognitive level, I mean, like when the brain isn't enjoying something like the learning as a, um, my W2 is a classroom teacher, you know, it's always trying to create an environment where students are comfortable, you know, safe, comfortable and enjoying things because the brain actually communicates better with itself. And so it's like, when you don't want to do something, it's like your dendrites and synapses actually go, eh! we don't want to talk. We don't want to shake. It's like, just don't fight that people. Just leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> like you're saying. Oh, sorry. I, I don't want to talk out. over the top of you. I think. No, it just cut out. Okay. <laughs> um, I, but I'm also a big believer in baby steps. So I'm not saying I'll never go back into the stock market, but if, um, you know, when I do, I might, I might do it eventually. It's going to be very small baby steps in a way that I can understand and with money that is really not that important to me. And so as I'm trying to learn that, cause I don't like it, I don't really get it. Um, but by exposure, many years of exposure, you eventually do get to know things. It's kind of like someone who has a partner who's in a business that they don't understand, but being around it and in that world for so many years, uh, they eventually do get the hang of it. And so I think, um, real estate underwriting is the same way for me. I am not a data-driven person. I'm more of a CEO personality. I want to read reports. I want to have a few pet metrics that I look at and I want to make decisions based on that. And I've got people to do and all delegate. those numbers. Being, I love it. I'm like, I'm all about delegating. So yeah. That's, that's yeah. And I, that's, that's a, a strength and a weakness. I'm really good at delegating, but I'm not that great at following up because I expect everybody to just have an individual level of excellence. Um, and not everybody <laughs> not everybody does and, and nobody's going to love your baby the way you love your baby and so I get all that but but just the last couple of years of being surrounded by underwriting and spreadsheets and data as far as that goes I'm just getting a little bit better a little bit better that's never going to be my core competency but because I'm around it and looking at it and understanding a little piece at a time um, imagine 10 years where I'm going to be with underwriting right. even though it's not my strength 
uh, I will be really good at it. So just drop by drop, just don't be overwhelmed. Don't try and drink from a fire hose. It doesn't have to be something that you love that you can get better at it. I'm never, <laughs> this might sound negative, but I don't think I'm ever gonna love underwriting ever. I'm gonna know how to read it. Um, yeah, so. I, I'm with you yeah. on that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, just don't. Yeah. <laughs> let me let me just don't take it too far. Yeah, I, I actually it, do yeah. like rant rules though, because I'm like, oh, it has to do with people. <laughs> like these are people. I see yeah. them. I'm like, I can. I'm like, rant rule is fun, but some of the other things I have to, I gotta trick myself into the other parts. <laughs> yeah, and it's. I'm not saying that because you hate doing something or because you procrastinate doing something, you should never invest in that thing. You know, play, build your, dominate on your strengths, but your weaknesses will come along yeah. as you dominate on those strengths because you can't help it. You got to look at this stuff. Eventually you will figure it out. You really so do. Don't, don't try and be an expert at the beginning, um, but also don't yeah. run away from something because certain parts of it um, are a little difficult. True, true. Um, I wanted to just ask you about resiliency because I think that um, you're like, maybe through this conversation, especially our pre-conversation, just some of our conversation may led me to understand how resilient you are as a woman, like, man, you know, which maybe that's not a word that you would, you know, put to yourself, but I see it when you go through a rough patch of something and it kind of happens all at once and you come out on the other side, that's, that's resiliency. And, um, and to come out, you know, to come out like that's amazing and I was wondering if you could share just some of the mindset what helped you kind of wade through and come out not fractured but come out thriving I say well when you said that word, I kind of cringed you did you know? why would you cringe that, at that? I think the, the, that really speaks directly to your question of what's the mindset you need to get through this stuff. When somebody calls me resilient, the first time, the first thing I think is, well, what's happened to me that's any worse that happens to anybody else? I think that there is an, a recognition and understanding that I know people who have lost a million, $2 million more than me and asking them for their advice. I have known people who not only have one child with a disability, but a severe disability. My my child is not severely disabled. I only have one who shows any sign of a of a disability. Um, who hasn't lost a parent will eventually lose a parent. These are these are things that are just part of the universal experience of being a human. Right. And so I have the idea that I have a pretty charmed life. Things don't get to me because I feel like there's something to learn in everything that happens to you. And if you get sucked into, oh, all these bad things have happened to me, um, that's, not, that's, that's not living life. Everybody has bad things happen to them. You're not a special snowflake because you've had hard things happen. You will make those hard things that have happened to you worse by wallowing around and why this to you? Why to anybody? Why does anybody go through these things? That's, it's just life. You know, get up and get over it because otherwise, and I, I think watching both of my parents um, at the end stages of their lives contemplate uh, looking back on their lives and evaluating what was really important, I've learned that what you leave behind isn't important. It, they're not going to enjoy any of those things that they left behind, even though it was important to them at the time to leave behind things that they had made with their hands or financial inheritances that we could have. But at the end of the day, they're not going to enjoy that. Life is about living. This is going to sound really selfish, but living yourself. It's going to be no good to anybody else if all you're thinking about is what you're going to leave behind, the legacy thumbprint that you're going to leave behind. What I think um, you're going to live your best life for yourself. And by being a whole healthy person, uh, it's just natural that you're going to reach out to help other people, your partner, your children, your business associates. Um, the less fortunate, that is part of what makes living your life fun and fulfilling. And getting bogged down in the bad things that happen, just, I don't, I don't know. It's not something I've ever struggled with. I've never, ever been the kind of person who sat around asking, why me? I only ask, why? 
yeah. what is to be learned from this? Because I'm going to go on from this and I'm going to have that experience to be able to make better decisions, to take less risks um, and to be happier with, with what life throws at me. And so um, I think balancing how to live your best life while still striving to live a better life is difficult for some people. My husband thinks that I'm perpetually discontented because I'm always, I'm never happy unless I'm impatient. I'm always doing something, building something, creating something, moving on to the next thing, learning another thing. I have a thousand hobbies. I've had two or three different careers. Um, and he looks at that as a sign that I'm discontented with my life. And so he's just now beginning to understand that I love my life. If I didn't, I wouldn't be pursuing all these other things. I get so excited about stuff. Um, and so just being able to say, hey, what that just happened to me and what just knocked me down is something that I'm gonna use to go on and make better decisions in the future so that I can continue to go out and be excited and explore things. That really motivates me. Amen on that. I got kicked to the curb a few different times, but early on in, in my early 20s, I got I got hammered really hard and that taught me a lot. And so when I say resiliency, it's like resilient people, they're not the ones that are, that are boo-hooing and why me and that's not fair. The resilient people are the ones that are like, okay, I always ask myself back then, I'm like, okay, what can I learn from this? Like, there's no sense in just dwelling in anything because I want to move on and have a fulfilled life. I don't want to just stay in the, the rubbish. And so the like, resiliency says, I'm, I'm going to just learn, I'm going to grow, and I'm going to move on, and I'm going to crush everything else because I learned from that. Don't have to redo that one. <laughs> I'm also a big believer though in just feeling the feels. Um, my dad just died. I was sad. I'm still sad. I'm gonna feel that and I'm gonna feel it deeply. I'm gonna feel it fully. Um, trying to deny that something difficult has happened. You know, I sat in my accountant's office the other day crying. Oh, you're gonna make me cry again, or I'm gonna make myself cry again. When I mean, we got into the car and we were driving away from the office, yeah, my husband was with me because I knew it was gonna be a difficult visit. And I could I, I just bawled and bawled and bawled. Um, those feelings are real and need to be experienced. Um, and so trying to, but I have people who ask me, well, what am I supposed to do? Just turn the feelings off and say, oh, I'm not gonna let this bother me. I'm just gonna bounce back. That's not the message here at all. The message here is feeling all the feelings, going through the feelings. And then once you've calmed down, making sense of them. It's kind of like when you're tired at night and you're arguing with your partner or your, or your child. Um, and then you wake up the next morning and you're refreshed and you're feeling calm and you're able to go address the situation. Um, don't try to make sense of the why, why some bad thing is happening to you or what you can learn from it when you're still in the middle of the feels. Yeah. Just feel it. Good nights. I took a couple of months to lie in bed and be depressed after my dad died. My son was diagnosed with autism right at the moment that this very difficult deal was coming unraveled at every turn. Every time we thought we solved a problem, another one came up. And my partner um, said that he was helping me deal with my negativity. He says, I, I see you as the negative person who needs to be lifted up. And I thought, what? I'm negative? Wait, that's what he, because he, that's when he met me was in the middle of all of this. Oh, and wow. so being, being resilient is not being in denial. It's, right. it's being able to take the time you need to feel what you feel and then make sense of it when you don't feel so awful. And then you come out of it on the other side, stronger and more resilient. Uh, there's no denial. <laughs> it, and there's no denying of, of emotions that are difficult. Just, just, it sometimes just takes some time, but the, the hopelessness that sets in that this is never going to get better. Every time things look up, something bad happens. Yeah, that's going to happen every single time. Things are going to go right and things are going to go wrong. Yeah. I know people who feel like anytime something goes right, they self-sabotage it because it's going to go wrong. Well, it's going to go wrong anyway. Why do you need to go in there and sabotage it? Oh, gosh. It's, it's, it's up and down. Ride the highs and, and go through the lows. They'll both be back. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's interesting. I talked to, um, yeah, I have this concept of like, 
you know, you can have everything. Like if this, if my hand was like my playing field, I could have my feelings of I'm afraid. And I tell my children this, I tell us to, I have to tell myself this and remind myself, right. But I can feel happy and afraid at the same time. Like, I, I feel like somehow we think we limit our feelings like, oh, I can only feel this one thing and I have to hold on to it forever and cap, like keep it close to me. It's like, well, you know, I mean, after my dad died, I still felt happy when I saw my kids smiling. And in fact, I found more joy and pleasure in my own children because I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, relationships became really more significant to me. But at the same time, I was holed up in my house, just grieving and crying in the shower and just mourning, you know, it's like, you can have, um, you can have all those feelings. And like you said, feel them. Like one of my friends, she told me, cause I told her, uh, said, Hey, I'm just going to stay. You're supposed to go through the stages of grief. You know what? I'm just going to, I told her I'm going to stay in denial because I feel closer to my dad and it doesn't hurt as much. So nobody can tell me which like, nobody can tell me I can't, I'm just going to stay in denial. And she gave me a smack down. <laughs> and she, I mean, good friend. She told me, you know, Hey, I tried that too. After my dad died 10 years later, I had to deal with it. So just feel your feelings and deal with it now. And I think that you're speaking so much truth on that note of like, you can't deny your feelings. You don't have to be overrun by them, but you, you got to deal with, I mean, like you got to acknowledge them. <laughs> And, and understanding that a lot of our feelings, and this is going to sound contradictory to what I just said, a lot of our feelings actually aren't real. We're tired. We're hungry. We're lonely. Yeah. Um, those types of things will amplify, like, you know, the, the, your, your dad did die. That was very sad. When does it bother you the most? When you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Those types of things will amplify it. And understanding that we have uh, hormonal processes in our body that cause us to feel certain ways at certain, um, certain physical uh, things where those emotions are being amplified far beyond what they deserve to have. And so feeling that, but also at the same time, understanding that it might be a little bit fake. It, you might be tired. Or amplified. Um, sleep on sure. feel better tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not saying that the underlying thing is not real or it's not worthy, but to understand that sometimes feeling things that you're going through are not actually completely 100% real. And so understanding that your feelings um, are somewhat in your control because you can go eat something. You can wait a week and suddenly, you know, it's a different time of the month. You yep. can sleep, you know, you can go recharge, refresh, cry in the shower, whatever. There are all sorts of ways that you can control your emotions. Um, and just learning, learning how to get hold of those uh, is really helpful. So feeling them, but not being consumed by them. I think that's the trick to not be consumed by them is understanding how much control you do have over them. Yes. Man, so awesome. I am so grateful just to share space with you and to hear you have so much, I mean, just insight into things um, and such a nice way of, of phrasing things. I really appreciate that. Is there anything else that you'd say, I really want people to know this, this last nugget. <laughs> Um, I took a personality test at a mastermind I was at last weekend that my initial reaction was complete and total denial. My husband was sitting behind me and he's back here. I'm like, I don't think I did this right. I think this is wrong. And he's back there going, and he was agreeing with almost everything on it. So this was just last weekend. So we're always on a path of self-discovery. Um, I recognized something in myself last weekend that I... I am a, a massive risk taker. People used to tell me, oh, you have a really high tolerance for risk. And I would say, actually, my risk tolerance is pretty low. And I heard a lot of investors say that they had a low risk tolerance. It's actually pretty low. And I'm sitting there like, oh, it's not. I you know, would never do what you're doing. Or I realize that I'm a pretty big risk taker. And I'm also um, incredibly independent. And so um, things that make total sense to me, they're like, of course, I'm going to homeschool my kids because I... You know, I, and other people are looking at going like, well, why would, why would I ever want to do that? Um, there are certain things about your personality that are going to inform your decisions and the way that you do things and being more in touch with what those are, whether they're normal or maybe a little bit um, outside of, they would measure on this personality test, they measured you how many steps away from the standard deviation, how many standard deviations you were from 
from the mean. And I was out here on one end and out here on a way off of, of the mean. And so it was, it was embarrassing. When they put it up on the screen, people started giggling. Like, <laughs> so understanding that about myself, I try and think oh, I'm a pretty normal person. Uh, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I realized looking at that, like, no, that's actually maybe not the case. Um, so understanding yourself, understanding your motivations, understanding why you do what you do, and also understanding that other people are in a different place than you are, um, helps you to be able to speak to a lot of different kinds of people. So when I'm talking to a passive investor who may be a lot closer <laughs> to the center on most of their personality traits, I have to have a different, I have to tap into a different part of myself to be able to talk to people who are, who are different than me. I realize that mo that's most people last week. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm, I took a yeah. personality test and it was like, you're a, it named me as a maverick. I, I'll, I forgot what the name of the test was, but you know, a the, lot the of predictive index is the maverick one. Is it, is that what you it are? It sounds like the same, the same one. Yeah. Yeah, and not just the Maverick, but an out in outer space Maverick. It was pretty bad. <laughs> My husband is he he had his uh, you know, and it actually rocked him. He was like, "Is that really?" But it's put understanding even who you are because we've been talking about those personality traits. Doing that with your partner is powerful because if you're kind to each other and have a good relationship, you can say, "Oh, hey, I think that that's." You know, that's kind of what part of that personality trait, like embrace it. It's not a weakness. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's how you're hardwired. Work with it. <laughs> yeah, my, my business coach is really into personality science and, and taking yours and understanding within the first couple of minutes of a conversation, the personality profile of a person you're talking to. So you can tap into that part of yourself because we all have all four things. It's right. just in, in differing levels. So tapping into that piece of you and having that conversation with another person one thing I really like about what she talks about is you can have a functional and a dysfunctional version of each personality type. Um, and so let's say, for example, the maverick, um, you can be overly concerned with status and what other people think about you. You can be um, intolerant of other people who aren't the way you are. Those, that's the dysfunctional side of, of that maverick or that red personality. Uh, but at the same time, the, the functional side of that is somebody who just gets a lot of stuff done. They go out and build things that help other people. And so understanding that you can be dysfunctional or functional either way um, is really important. Understanding um, how your personality can be an asset to you and how it can be um, um, detrimental and just getting really understanding that both sides of it, of yours and other people's. Because you can have, I've dealt with a lot of people who are very, um, make decisions very emotionally and they want to have a relationship and a connection before they're going to make a decision. I just don't think that's valid data to base a decision on is how well you like somebody. They want to talk, they want to get to know you. That can be dysfunctional. They believe everything that anybody ever says to them. Um, they're making decisions without adequate data. So understanding that their dysfunctional side and feeding into that, you're taking advantage of them. So find the functional side of building relationships. You know, your network is your net worth and coming at them from the functional side of that so that you are serving them rather than taking advantage of their weaknesses. That, that's huge. You got to understand yourself. You got to understand others. I have a long way to go there, but it's another new frontier that I'm attacking right now. So exactly. I, I think it's really exciting. That is really exciting. Well, thanks again. And I'm going to be, as always, every, all of Emma's information, like how you can reach out and contact her. Make sure you, you know, go to the different places that I'm going to put hyperlinks to so that you can connect with her and get to know her better and show her love. They, she's given us some time and a lot of valuable information. So um, make sure you go do that. And remember, you are one choice away from changing your life. The life of your dreams, one choice away. Go live it. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of Ask Me How I Know. My guests are the most humble successes, so be sure to show them your appreciation by rating this episode five stars, which sounds silly, but let's be real. Ratings, likes, and shares, they take no time at all, but make all the difference in the world, if only to boost morale. Also, since I don't spend time on the how and why they got into investing, 
be sure to check out the show notes to get to know more about today's guests, including other podcasts they've been on that has a more traditional format that will give other details about their investment journey. It'll also tell you things like the most influential person in their life and what they're reading right now, as well as how to connect with them. And please subscribe and rate Ask Me How I Know so it reaches other listeners like you. Until next time, go find your freedom.